Hi everyone, this is Counseling 4480, Zunker Chapter 10, Gender Issues and Dual Careers. Historically, jobs for women were clerk, teacher, and nurse. Often you would hear people say, how would this job fit into your husband's occupational goals? So what's going on is that the husband or the male person basically decides what he wants to do and how does the woman accommodate that male person? A career first in marriage maybe now or later is the new order of preference for those who aspire for a career outside the home. Barriers that still remain for women are bias associated with gender stereotypes in the working world still exist. Women who give their career development equal status with their husbands will find acceptance of their roles personally challenging with little support from many men and women. So right there, you have to think about the fact that as a social construct, we are seen uh, or we're taught to see women as kind of the second uh, person, right? So if she wants to do something, uh, sometimes it's seen as negative even by women themselves because a lot of women were also treated and trained to, to, to believe in this style as well, that the man is the dominant person who gets to decide exactly what the woman will do. You work around the man. Gender issues are gender stereotypes. So, you know, there's certain things that uh, belong to men and then there's certain things that belong to women. Occupational inequality. So there's also an unevenness when it comes to, let's say, pay or uh, time off and stuff like that. And then there's also sexual harassment. There's also dual career couples uh, and they have role conflicts, you know, who makes more money and who gets to stay at home and take the care of the kids, who does the chores, all that can actually cause a lot of conflict. And of course, child care in the sense of, you know, do we give this to a family member? Do we give this child to a family member? Or do we go and hire someone uh, to take care of our children? And what are the results because of that? And we'll discuss all of this as we go along through this chapter. Factors that influence gender development. Gender development does not stop when you graduate from high school, tech school, or college or marriage. It continues on forward. Think about roles that people have, uh, you know, all through life. Behavior is modified and reinforced by contextual and situational factors one experiences. Okay, so what that is saying is as you experience how people treat men and women at a job, you will notice that men and women will behave differently at a job. Sociocultural context of one's environment determines to a large extent the character and uniqueness of each individual's gender development. So for this one right here, we're talking about, again, the environment uh, determines a lot of the times how a person can uh, see themselves, right? So if it is an environment where women and men are seen equally, then you'll see an attitude change where, you know, they'll say, well, a man or a woman can do this. Whereas there are certain types of situations where you're like, well, I don't see any women in this job. Can women even do this job? Women's psychology has been integrated into mainstream psychology, human development, counseling, and sociology. So when you guys are looking at your books right now, you will notice that uh, they'll talk about women's rights or women's issues in uh, education and in psychology and all of the stuff is because uh, women are now making it more clear that we need to be part of this conversation, uh, that it can't be all male dominated because it's not necessary all that because half the world population, if not more, is or are women. Men and women are more similar than different is another uh, emphasis that they wanted to say. Uh, observe gender behavior in shared contextual relationships. Uh, do not stop pointing out differences between men and women. So you want to point out those things so that you can point out the reasons why this might not necessarily make sense because you're like, well, a woman or a man can do this. Why does it have to always be a man? Systems approach to build greater understanding of the gender socialization process. And as we talk about these things, we're breaking down gender construct. We'll realize, you know, um, a lot of this stuff is just society dictating it for one reason or another. And there's real no logical reason why. Um, each person is influenced by a number of specific cultural and situational factors that contribute to the development of preferred gender roles. Again, we're talking a lot about social constructs right here, right? Um, things that society just deem, not necessarily with a specific reason to back it up. 
Overview of Gender in the Workplace. So in early human existence, women and men worked side by side and shared home responsibilities. And that continued for thousands of years. And then there was the rise of the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s to 1800s. A lot of people started to relocate uh, the, uh, themselves to a workplace. That means often going into the city. Factory work was done by men, usually, and household tasks were done by females. Women became secondary citizens in society, led to a call for equality, such as the right to vote or suffrage, right? So now that men are often going out to work in the factories because let's say it's a little bit more dangerous or whatever, and women were uh, told to stay at home, take care of the children, take care of the home, cook and stuff like that, suddenly there's an inequality because men are making money. They seem to be more important than rearing children in that culture. This perspective continues to today. Men are breadwinners and head of household. Women who did work were secretaries, teachers, and nurses. So again, playing supporting roles to, let's say, the CEO or the boss, uh, the principal, or let's say a doctor. In World War II, women were starting to take over men's jobs, manufacturing plants, uh, build ships and aircrafts, and management positions. The reason why, again, is because men went to war, and so women needed to go into the factories to make, let's say, supplies or living uh, thing, uh, goods and stuff like that so that they can still have an economy at home or send things over to the war. People who are, have disabilities were also now welcome to work a little bit more. And so when this happened, it basically showed that women can do the same things that men can do. Uh, people with disabilities can do the same things that people without disabilities can do. And then once the war was over in 1945, women were then suddenly sent back home, so uh, or back into the home anyways. So if you think about that, uh, these women were now making their own money and everything, and they're suddenly going, well, the men are back, so you guys have to go back to where you were before. So a lot of women were like, hey, wait a minute. I actually can do this. Why can't I continue to do this? Why do I need to go back uh, to serve the man this way instead? In the 1970s, three influential movements happened. The first one was the Civil Rights Movement. Number two was the anti-Vietnam War protesters. And then three was Second Wave of Women's Movement. Um, this contributed to socioeconomic change because people started to uh, see how there are differences in uh, possibilities when it comes to work and that changed the economy of finances for a lot of women because they wanted to go work and be independent and stuff like that. Needed two paychecks to pay the bill was another reason the cost of living, the cost of raising a children uh, or children, I'm sorry, uh, could also be very, very expensive. And so now maybe having a double income would be able to help them afford a home and then also let's say childcare and other uh, things that they would want to enjoy. The top 10 occupations for women, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2010, number one was secretaries or administrative assistants, two is elementary and middle school teachers, three registered nurses, four nursing and a psychiatric and home health aides, five is bookkeeping, accounting and auditing clerks, six receptionists and information clerks, Seven was maids and housekeepers. Uh, eight is teacher assistants. Nine is child care workers. And 10 is personal and home care aides. So you sort of see some of them kind of being very similar, right? So a lot of it is serving other people. Seems to be uh, the, the typical woman's job. In the 2000s, women have lower career aspirations than men in statistics, and that they take longer to choose a career path. But there's a reason why. There's a lot of considerations. Women will have the children and are often um, expected to take care of their children. So they're not necessarily going to have as high of an aspiration to find that job because they say, oh, well, you know what, what if I work really hard and then I get a kid, then I have to like leave this job. So let me let me think about other jobs that, you know, might not be so bad, right? Um, or not so bad when I have to quit all of a sudden because of uh, my child. Uh, women are concerned about prejudice of colleagues, which means that there are uh, men and other women who might not actually see women as uh, really good workers or really good colleagues, you know, co-workers. Sexual discrimination and harassment is often experienced by women. There's also inflexible work patterns. So when we talk about that is, let's say that, let's say um, a person does decide to have a child, you know, um, 
a, a reasonable request would be, you know, let me be able to drop my kids off at school in the morning and then go pick them up after school. And then I'll work there. Then I'll maybe work extra hours on certain days so that uh, I don't miss out on my family as well as work. But sometimes companies will say, nope, you work from this time to this time and that is it. Because John, you know, John Doe, a male, can do it. So you should be able to do it as well. And then difficulty in being accepted in senior management. Um, and the, uh, an example would be Walmart. Uh, there was a lawsuit where uh, women were suing Walmart because uh, a lot of the men were senior positions or held senior positions while women were all working kind of like cashier service and they never got promoted very high. Um, and so there was a belief that there was a gender difference, a gender discrimination uh, thing going in Walmart. So definitely it's something that you can look up on the internet and read more about. In 2002, women were 40% of the entering medical students in the U.S. So you'll see that, you know, the helping, the service, uh, the nurturing kind of jobs like nursing and, and, and medical stuff is much more women oriented or women were interested in going into it. However, in the corporate world, men still rule when it comes to the Silicon Valley and uh, major corporations. There's very, very few women CEOs in that field. Inequality in the workplace. Women now occupy an increased share of high paying jobs, which is wonderful. Women still dominate low paying jobs as well. And the disturbing thing is when women and men occupy the same occupation, which basically means they work in the same job, men receive higher pay than women. I know you guys are saying, no, that doesn't really happen. You know, I know my coworker who is a guy, if you're a female, um, who, uh, you know, we both get to pay the same. Usually lower paying jobs, you might not necessarily see it, but as you grow older and you're working in higher positions, that is when you're going to start to notice it a lot more where even though you both are, let's say, art directors or editors, uh, the men will be, pay be paid a little bit more. Okay, or a lot more. Um, examples also are chief executives, lawyers, computer programmers, school teachers, and retail sales retail salesperson. Believe it or not, um, the previous administration tried to make it so that uh, people's salaries were open to comparison, so that we know that men and women would be paid the same for the same job and the same amount of work. However, this current administration right now, they decided to stop that. So now we really don't know. Um, what the difference is between a man and a woman who are working the same job with the same responsibilities, whether or not the men are being paid more, which uh, historically has been uh, the case. Anderson and Taylor wrote in 2013 a study that they did in 2009 that white men, non-Latinx, receive significantly higher pay than female whites. Same was true for African uh, American men and Asians and Latinx Americans. The difference between African American and Latinx men and women were not as large as between men and women. Okay, so what they're saying is um, white men make a lot of money. They get paid the most for the same job. Okay, um, and then after that would be uh, African American men, Asian Latinx. They get paid uh, less, but uh, the the difference between men and or uh, minority people and women is not as different as it between uh, men and women. Income differences between men and women. Women earn less than men. Greatest inequality takes place between the ages of 45 and 55. So as you establish your career, right, like, you know, you've been working in your 20s and 30s to develop this higher position, if you were hoping for that, you'll realize that uh, the inequality between men and women are really high during this time period. Least inequality takes place between 16 and 24. Again, because during that time period, it doesn't really require a lot of, um, let's say, uh, complicated work. Usually you're doing uh, sales and stuff like that. And so that the, the pay might be very much more similar. And you can also look at box 10.1 for reasons why on uh, page 252. Gender stereotypes. Knowledge societies, more work tasks can be done equally well by both sexes. Um, so what they're saying is once you start to become a professional in a specific field and you know this specific field very well, you'll notice that um, they can be paying very well. Gender stereotypes are what one perceives as appropriate roles for women and men, whether they are accurate or not. So gender stereotypes is again what a cultural uh, uh, a cultural construct or a social construct is all about, okay? It doesn't necessarily make sense, it's just that's just what we believe.
Gender stereotyping promotes the belief that women should be traditionally feminine and men are to be traditionally masculine. Today, these ideas are starting to go away, especially in millennial culture. Um, now it's more acceptable, let's say, for men to wear florals or pink colored shirts, but I'm sure part of your friends and stuff, if you saw a guy wear a pink shirt, you're gonna go, oh, what's going on? Is he maybe gay or something like that? Or if you see a woman with a short haircut and maybe wearing a lot of, let's say, pants and button down shirts, I wonder if she's like really a woman, is she a lesbian or something like that? And that's part of society thinking that, right? But more and more millennials are starting to say, you know, no, these gender stereotypes, these social constructs are awful. They are making us not be our authentic selves. Let us be our authentic selves and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, we want to be able to control ourselves and decide exactly how we present ourselves, which is wonderful. And that's really, really great. But you'll look in back in the olden days when you look at men and women, they tend to behave in very specific ways that are now slowly being broken down in uh, America and as well as the rest of the world. Glass ceiling is, in a, is a terminology in uh, corporate America. It's an invisible barrier that blocks women from high level positions. So basically what it is, is if you imagine a ceiling made of glass, you can see it, right? You can see uh, the next level, but for some reason you can't get through that glass uh, ceiling, although you can see where it is, you can't reach it. You can never ever get it. And that's what the term glass ceiling is all about. Um, there's also the word sticky floor, which is a metaphor for women who are not promoted because they're not uh, men. So because they're women, they cannot get out of this position that they're stuck in. Sexual harassment. Working Women's Institute in 1980 said, sexual harassment was the single most widespread occupational hazard that women face in the workforce. So let me emphasize that one more time. Sexual harassment was the single most widespread occupational hazard that women face in the workforce. Uh, in 1991, Senate hearings involving Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas and his accuser Anita Hill was a big issue because Anita Hill uh, accused uh, Clarence Thomas, who was part of the Supreme Court, of sexual harassment. And a lot of people actually did not believe her and criticized her. And um, it was found out that, you know, he did sexually harass her. But the thing is, why don't people believe in women? And this is why when you see the Me Too movement, a lot of people are saying, believe women. Okay. Um, does it always mean that it's true? No, it doesn't. But what has happened in the past is that a lot of times women are just thrown away, not uh, taken seriously. So now we're going the opposite way and saying, you know, let's believe women, listen to them and see exactly what they're saying. Um, because most likely in statistics, it says that it is often true. The U.S. Navy uh, tailhook scandal involving the mistreatment of women by U.S. Navy personnel is also another historically uh, common thing when it comes to sexual harassment. There is actually a lot of military sexual trauma that happens to women in the military that a lot of people don't talk about. Um, and uh, often women are abused mentally, physically, uh, they are raped, they are sexually violated, they are hurt in a uh, military base. Uh, and it happens more often than you think, unfortunately. What constitutes a sexual harassment? So let's talk a little bit about the definition. Quote unquote, reasonable women standard was applied as an appropriate legal criterion. If a reasonable woman would consider behavior offensive, even though a man would not, the court would rule that sexual harassment had occurred. So let's talk a little bit about an example. Let's say that you are a woman who is working at an office and then suddenly your male boss or male coworker comes over and uh, basically starts touching you and giving you a back rub without you asking them. That might feel really uncomfortable, awkward, weird, uh, scary for some people. And they're saying that if a typical person, a typical woman, uh, believed that that was uncalled for, unnecessary, and is considered harassment, then it would be uh, determined that sexual harassment had occurred. And of course, women can sexually harass other women as well, uh, and stuff like that. 50% of working women will experience sexual harassment in their jobs. Again, let's listen to this or think about this statistic. 50% or half of working women will experience sexual harassment in their jobs. I will 
uh, recommend or motivate you to actually start talking to the women in your lives, mothers, grandmothers, uh, aunts, sisters, uh, you know, mentors, women, and ask them delicately, obviously, you know, now that you've been working in the world for like, let's say 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, have you ever experienced things that made you uncomfortable that a man did to you, right? Or said to you, um, and you'll be surprised how many women will say yes. Um, and other considerations are if the behavior was judge extreme. So, you know, like people are like, whoa, that's not necessary. That could be considered harassment there. Um, if the victim was responsible for what happened as well. Um, and that would be, uh, you know, let's say that if the victim was the one who was um, uh, doing it, the typical woman would agree that this was something that the woman did, then, you know, then that, that would uh, be sided with uh, the man. If the perpetrator was a direct supervisor of the victim, so if it's a person of power over the other person, um, there might actually be some sexual harassment if the reasonable woman uh, believed that. And then also if there was significant frequency of outcome or of occurrence, I'm sorry. Um, what that means is basically how often does it happen? Um, once sexual harassment has happened and the woman, let's say, says, stop this, I don't want this, this is not welcome, does the man continue to do it all the time anyways afterwards, even if they are saying it's a joke now or relax and stuff like that? Unfortunately, if it frequently happens, that can make a person feel very uncomfortable at a workplace. And so that uh, if the reasonable woman believes that that is more than uh, necessary when it comes to the occurrence, then that could also be seen as sexual harassment. Sexual harassment, unwelcome sexual overtures, or requests of sexual favors. Quid pro quo is a Latin term. Some type of reward is offered for sexual behavior. So um, a boss, a male boss, and let's give you that as an example, says, you know, if you go on a date with me, you know, maybe you can get a promotion. Okay, so if you do this, you get that. That's what quid pro quo means. Creates an offensive and hostile work environment because people are going to go, well, I don't want to do this. So if I don't do this, I'm going to keep on staying where I am. Uh, and that's not fair, even though I deserve, let's say, a raise or a promotion. Um, it, it becomes demeaning to women. Sexual harassment awareness and prevention are part of incoming training for uh, for new staff. Um, I'll give you an example is every year um, faculty members of uh, the school uh, are required to take a sexual harassment uh, workshop and to make sure that we are aware of what's going on and how to handle sexual harassment when it happens. Sensitivity training programs, how people respond to being touched when engaged in a conversation. What is considered offensive physical contact? So what is considered inappropriate touching? Cultural differences in physical contact is something that we need to also talk about. There are some cultures where men and women do not touch. So if a man touches a woman in that culture in public, it might be very, very traumatic for that person. Uh, and it might embarrass, anger, annoy, uh, provoke uh, that person. So we have to be careful, be culturally competent. Inappropriate verbal statements. So sometimes there are words that can actually be considered harassment, uh, hurtful, and so we want to be aware of those vocabulary words as well. And then comments about physical appearance, like, hey, uh, you know, you look really nice today, but there's an appropriate way to say something like that as opposed to, you know, hey, I really like your chest or something like that to a woman, which is, could be considered very, very inappropriate, okay? Sexual harassment creates offensive and hostile work environments. Um, already, if you think about work in some places, it's already a very stressful condition. You're supposed to achieve all this work. You're supposed to try to compete with your coworkers to do really good. Um, Self-destructive behaviors can lead to health problems. If you're not taking care of yourself, obviously you can uh, get sick, right? Uh, when you are stressed out, upset, uh, full of anxiety and paranoia, right, uh, because you think that someone's out there because of the sexual harassment, you can actually start to get sick. Learning to deal with stress is an essential task in order to manage all life roles, which is why um, a lot of your instructors here are asking you, hey, what are you doing for fun? What do you do to take care of yourself? What, whether it is, you know, going to get your nails done, going to get coffee with your friends, go see a movie, go eat out, you know, do fun things, hiking, whatever it is. We want to promote that you do things to take care of yourself. When you're stressed out for some people, they might want to go out on a long walk to think about what's 
what's going on, to reflect, to contemplate exactly what's going on in their lives. And so those are things that definitely help you deal with your stress. The workplace and family needs, women and men also share work roles in dual career marriages. Cornell and couples and career study, uh, women assume more responsibility than men for child care. That doesn't sound too surprising, right? Women are assuming the dual role of homemaker and then also the worker in today's time. Issues include expectations and intentions of work and family. So these are things that to, to, to basically have you talk about, right? Um, wh when am I going to work and when am I going to have a family and how is that going to actually work out? Uh, role conflict. Who is going to be the one at home taking care of the children? Who's going to go out to work? Child care, again, where do we uh, uh, teach our children how to do the things that they need to do as they're growing up? So that's daycare and then also school as well. And of course, relationship factors. How do we see each other as well? And that can be a, a source of major conflict. Issues facing dual career families, expectations and intentions of work and family. Women and men reared in dual career families were highly committed to role sharing marriage. What that is saying is that when men and women are raised with parents that both work in careers that they want, they're more likely to understand how to make a relationship like that work for themselves. Lack of agreement between expectations of roles in marriage has potential to create interpersonal tension. So when you don't communicate with your partner, then of course relationships are going to have some problems there because of the communication or lack of communication. Men have shown to be more willing to participate in household tasks than in the past. So you millennials, you Gen X and stuff like that and the future and so forth are much more open to helping out in the home than prior uh, generations where they said, you know, men basically go to work, come home, relax while the woman takes care of the man uh, and stuff like that. Now, men are willing to also go, hey, let me help out with, you know, uh, home life as well uh, when I come home. There's also role conflict, generally thought of as a system of competing demands from different roles. Conflict is between family roles as well as work roles. Growing trend is for husband and wife to share family roles and more complex uh, when the family includes childcare. So imagine if you were married to a partner, right? Are you gonna talk about who does what um, and stuff like that? And then imagine now throwing in a child into that mix. So you have to make sure that your child is alive, healthy and happy, but then also now decide how you're gonna raise that child. Imagine, let's say you were uh, raised going to private school and your partner was not. And your par partner says, public school is really good. And then you're saying, no, private school is really good. Look at me, I'm educated, right? But then that person is like, maybe I'm educated as well. So then there's hardy right there tension. And you'll hear about that uh, often when people are starting a family is, what do we do with our child, right? How do we raise our child? And so that's what we're talking about when it comes to role conflict. In heterosexual marriages, African-American and Latinx men do more household chores than European men. And although women have somewhat been relieved of household tasks in the past 30 years, they continue to do most work and assume the most responsibility for household tasks as well. So although more and more men are willing to do uh, household work, women are still doing the majority of it. Klinger in 1988 model designed to delegate household tasks based on interests, aptitudes, and time available. So they start to talk about, you know, hey, how can we resolve these kind of uh, role conflicts that we have? So the flexible model based on the situation of economic factors changing. So one of the things is, you know, let's talk about who makes more money. Maybe that might be an important factor. Some tasks are viewed as more desirable than others. Maybe one of you likes to take out the trash while you uh, hate doing laundry. So then we start to talk about, oh, I like this. I don't mind doing this. What are you, you know, what are your feelings on this? And then from there deciding that way. Most per, uh, preferred and least preferred tasks should be rotated. So let's say, um, uh, doing laundry is hated by both people. So maybe one person might agree to do it for the months of January and uh, March, 
May and stuff like that, like every other month. Well, then the other person will then do the laundry for the other uh, every other month that way. So that way, one person doesn't get burdened to do the stuff that they both hate. You both have to share um, uh, that type of work. And maybe you really love, um, let's say, taking out the trash. So that means that one person will do it for a month and then the other person might do it for a month or every other week or whatever it is that you and your partner talk about. Recycling or switching around that ensures an equitable division of labor. So again, uh, switch it up maybe every six months or every year or something like that so that no one feels like they're burdened to do something specific all the time. And you can see the model on page 256 and 257. Child care. When both parents work, child care becomes a critical issue. Half of three-year-olds are in child care facilities, and 66% of four-year-olds are in child care facilities. So as you can see there, um, more and more parents are working outside, and so they need child care so that they can actually make the money to pay for the home or pay for child care uh, and raise that family. Other forms of child care are sitters, daycare homes, and then also having your relatives help you. Um, there are also things that we need to uh, think about when it comes to payment and stuff like that, which is emergency care. Let's say if something happens, where do we put our child, right? Are there discounts? Are there vouchers that we can get? Is there a referral service? Um, is there on-site daycare at the workplace of, of one partner? Um, and then also, are there flexible benefits to all of this? Family-oriented work policies. Um, so. Um, Believe it or not, there are some jobs now that are very, very family oriented. They actually encourage you and they are happy the fact that you do have a family because the happy person at home usually is the happy worker at work, right? Uh, and so there are actually some places that uh, cater towards that or are considerate of it. So they'll allow telephone access for personal phone calls to uh, and from children. So let's say if their child needs to talk to them, they can actually talk to them. Parent to leave when a child is seriously ill. So let's say if a child gets the flu or something that needs to be uh, at home, the, one parent can actually stay at home and take care of the child while the flu uh, goes through their system, let's say. And then um, flex time permits parents to choose arrival and departure times within a set range. So that allows them to, let's say, come to work right after they drop off their child and get to leave uh, right before their child gets out of work or get, I'm sorry, get out of school. Um, and then let's say maybe they might work longer at home or additional hours at home or on the weekends. There's also a uh, flex place work, which is part of work at home and then part uh, of work at work. And then of course, telecommunicating, basically using the computer at home uh, to do work uh, in the office, but from home. Sometimes one or both parents work from home and that's also something that's very new. Um, it used to not be like that until the ad invention of computers that allow people to now work almost anywhere as long as there's an internet access. Studies about daycare facilities versus home care, they are the same with daycare facilities being beneficial if it is a high quality type of daycare facility. So obviously there are cheap ones um, that might be having low uh, quality because it is more affordable and there's like really expensive ones. So they're saying that depending on the quality of it, obviously then it might actually be better to have them in that place. Characteristic of high quality infant toddler daycare is the physical setting itself. How is the environment there? Do they have lots of things that allow the child to learn and feel, uh, you know, participate in different activities? Uh, the child themselves, how many children are there to an adult who's a caregiver? Is it one child to one ch uh, person or is it more like 10, chi 10 children to one person, one adult? Obviously with that, there's less attention and so then the quality may go down. Caregiver characteristics and qualifications. Does this caregiver, this adult, have an education in uh, child rearing, about child development? If they do, they might be able to recognize certain qualities uh, that need attention or need to be discussed, right? Whereas there's a, you know, an everyday person who's like, oh, I just need a job, so I'm gonna apply here. And they get that job and they don't really necessarily know how to take care of a child. They can keep the child alive, right? Uh, but they might not necessarily understand all those things. So again, the quality can go down because of that. Toys and activity. Toys or playtime is actually for children, the time where they learn about cause and effect, 
neglect and all that type of stuff. So if there's lots of uh, stimulation that is, uh, you know, going around, um, that actually might increase that child's uh, ability to explore and understand things in a faster way or, or, or whatever it is. There's also family links and then, of course, licensing. Is this a legal place where they're qualified to do all this stuff? Is there, do they know CPR? Do they know all this stuff, you know, about learning about alphabet um, and stuff like that. And obviously you can see how the quality of it can then differ. Relationship factors. So this is uh, talking about the, the, let's say you and your partner are a couple and how they deal with each other and work with each other. So geographical relocation to enhance the husband or the wife's career is a major issue. Imagine you and your partner uh, realizing that, you know, one of you has to move to a different state because they're going to make twice as much money. Do we both want to do that then? Do we both want to get up and move over to that state um, so that we can make more money? Or uh, is the quality of life where we're living now much better than the other place? So what do we do? What kind of communication? How do we discuss it? Uh, how do we make that decision is important could represent a sacrifice by one spouse, especially if, let's say, one of them does not want to go there. Like, oh, I don't like that city or I don't like that state. So we could be sacrificing someone's happiness there. So it's definitely something that really involves a lot of communication. Maybe it's a deal where uh, we'll just work there or live there for two years and then we'll move again. Well, let's consider moving again. Competition between partners then can also be uh, something that exists, right? So let's say you and your partner are working and then suddenly one of you guys makes a lot more money than the other. Does the one who makes less feel a little jealous? Um, are they going to uh, become upset and not talk to the other person about it and share those feelings and then just be rude and be annoying or being confrontational, but never really talking about it? Because that can also ruin a relationship, right? When one spouse develops feelings of insecurity, frustration from the other spouse, Feelings of competition may not be expressed directly, like we said before. Uh, their work schedules might conflict, and that might also make uh, a partner very unhappy. Let's say that you work from 9 to 5, but your partner works from uh, 5 to 3 in the morning or something. That means most of the time you guys are not even going to see each other. How is that going to work? Are you going to feel lonely, or does your partner feel lonely that we don't even see each other anymore? We're almost like roommates that never see each other. There's also family, uh, I'm sorry, uh, vacation schedules. So are we able to actually uh, talk to our places of work and schedule a time so that we can both travel together or do things together uh, for the family, you know, in terms of vacation and holidays and stuff like that. And of course, childcare commitments like we've talked about before. Uh, who makes the decisions in the family? Is there a way for it to be more equitable or equal? Reaching mutual agreements in both major and minor decisions, can you do that? Can you both agree on those big picture questions like when to move? And then also minor decisions like, let's say, do we allow our child to grow their hair long if they want to grow their hair long or cut their hair short if they really want to cut their hair short. Um, you can also see Appendix F for intervention strategies such as working climate, expressiveness training, dual que uh, career roles, and then also life uh, lifestyle skills. And that's it for this chapter.